Welcome everybody to the strange and scary mysteries of the month. Where we find you the craziest stories from all around the world currently going down. Lay them out for you to wrap your head around. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here are the strange and scary mysteries of the month for March 2024. Number 5. 1978 Burger Chef Murders When the Speedway, Indiana police were called to check on a possible robbery that occurred at the Burger Chef restaurant, they initially thought that it wasn't even a robbery, but probably the kids that worked there looking to party. And they really messed up because they couldn't have been more wrong. On Friday night, November 17th in 1978, four employees were closing up shop at the Burger Chef, located on Crawfordville Road. They were assistant manager, 20-year-old Jane Frett, 16-year-olds Daniel Davis and Mark Flemons, and Ruth Ellen Shelton, who was 18. And just the regular group of young people you'd find at most fast food places anywhere in the country. A little before midnight, another employee and friend who was off that night went by to see what everyone was doing after they closed up for the night. Only nobody was there. There were no signs of any issues other than the back door and safe being open. When police arrived, they found about $100 left in the cash register, but discovered $581 had in fact been taken from the safe. There was an empty roll of tape also next to it, but that didn't mean much to them at the time, though in hindsight, it was probably pretty important. With no sign of a struggle, though it's unclear how hard they actually looked, the responding officers, for one reason or another, pieced together that most likely what had happened was that the four employees, who often went to the same gatherings in town together, decided they needed some money to go partying, and so they took what was in the safe. Though... $581 back then equates to around $2,500 in today's dollars, which isn't anything to sneeze at. So, even if their theory was right, they should have taken the whole situation much more seriously, yet they didn't. The next morning, Burger Chef employees got to working, cleaning up the place before opening. They washed the floors, cleaned all the surfaces, and tossed away any trash, like the spent tape roll. In other words, they got rid of all the evidence. The following Sunday afternoon, a hiker who was 20 miles away from the burger joint stumbled upon the bodies of the four hikers laying in the woods. Shelton and Davis had each been shot multiple times by a 38, and Fret was stabbed in the chest a few times, the blade getting stuck inside while the handle was missing. And Flemons was essentially bludgeoned to death, although... His real cause of death would be from choking on his own blood. Once the bodies were found, one of the officers admitted, we screwed up, and they most certainly did. A teenage eyewitness who was in the parking lot around closing time came forward claiming to have seen two guys who he thought looked suspicious in their car, sort of casing the joint. They were in their 30s, both white guys, and one of them had a beard. But without any evidence in the restaurant or at the crime scene, this was not going to be an easy case to figure out. A few months later, though, a man who was at a bar in the nearby town of Greenwood would start bragging about his involvement in the killings. He had a few too many, and so, you know, loose lips sink ships. Police got a hold of this guy who told them he was just trying to act cool. And after a thorough interrogation, he passed a polygraph, so... He was off the hook, but he did provide the names of some other guys that he said were part of a fast food robbery gang, and maybe they were involved. Through this, they found a suspect who had a beard, like the eyewitness had mentioned. He was brought in for a lineup, and wouldn't you know it, he shaved that beard the night before he had to come in to the station, a beard he had had for over five years. Another person, that man from the bar named, became a suspect, but police couldn't pin the murders on him. Though, he would go on to be jailed for a totally different robbery of none other than a fast food restaurant. Despite the specter of other crimes haunting Speedway, investigators were steadfast in their belief that the tragic end met by the Burger Chef employees was the outcome of a robbery interrupted 
possibly gone awry at the recognition of one of the perpetrators by an unintended witness. Leads were pursued, suspects questioned, and theories were constructed, yet the path to justice was marred by dead ends and elusive evidence. The case took on a new life in 84 with the confessions of Donald Forrester, a man already behind bars looking for a reduced sentence claiming involvement. He talked of this being a case of Jane Frett's brother owing drug money and them looking to intimidate and collect. Only once kidnapped, Jane fought back, at which point they accidentally hurt her pretty bad and then just decided to get rid of any and all witnesses. But Forrester ended up recanting his confession and the case ultimately went cold again, which is where it is now. And no one has ever been charged with any involvement in the crimes, and the case is still open. A lesson learned, hopefully, by police is when there's money missing, don't assume it's just a bunch of wild and crazy teens looking to have some fun. Number four, the warnings of Brandy Bradley. From Kokoma, Indiana, comes the tragic story of 44-year-old Brandy Bradley, a woman known for her vibrant personality and active presence on TikTok, who suddenly vanished, leaving behind a trail of digital breadcrumbs that pointed to a terrible fate. Her official disappearance on February 11th sparked an intense investigation by the Kokoma Police Department, but it was her haunting messages shared on social media that painted a picture of a life left in fear that implicated someone Brandy was very close to. Brandy's last contact with her family was actually on January 19th, but her voice continued to echo through the videos she had posted on TikTok. In these clips, she warned of the violence she faced at the hands of Jonathan Christie, her 39-year-old boyfriend. Her allegations were not just for attention, and they were desperate cries for help, her way of letting the world know that she was in serious trouble. I've been choked out five times, unconsciousness, and TikTok needs to know, she declared in one video, ending with a heart-wrenching plea, help me. The gravity of her situation became even more apparent when she ominously predicted, if I end up dead and my dismembered body is found all over Kokomo, it was Jonathan Christie. And this prophecy shared with her followers turned her social media into a testament of her struggle for survival. There were several other posts that painted a grim picture. And despite her efforts to alert anyone who came across her page, the videos soon mysteriously disappeared from her TikTok channel altogether, as if someone didn't want them getting any more attention. All this led authorities right to Jonathan, who has now been arrested and charged with murder in connection with Bradley's disappearance. Because beyond just the videos, around January 20th, right around the time her family stopped hearing from her, Jonathan had asked around to a few people, seeing if he could use their burn piles. Other witnesses also noted that he had inexplicably spray-painted his truck on the day Bradley vanished. The discovery then of human bones, a necklace, a tarp, and a belt, among other melted items in a dumpster in Kempton, have added possible hard evidence to this case. These items were allegedly disposed of by Christie, though the bones' identities at the time of making this remain unconfirmed. Kokomo Police Department urges anyone with information to come forward as the search for justice continues for Brandy Bradley. Number three, help solve J.C. McGee case. July 11, 2002 marked a turning point for the McGee family from Belmont County, Ohio, and it would forever change the trajectory of Madison McGee's life in more ways than one. That night, J.C. McGee was found dead with a single bullet to the head on the doorstep of his own home, a home that should have been a sanctuary for him and his family transformed in an instant into the start of a tragic mystery. It was determined by police that J.C.'s death was the result of a home invasion gone wrong, and that was it for them, case closed. But it looks like there's a lot more to this story than what was told. And now, at the heart of all this, unearthing for new evidence and truth, 
is his daughter, Madison. At the time of his passing, Madison was just six years old and living in Charleston, South Carolina with her mom and grandmother. She only visited her father and half-sister on occasion up in Ohio, and so the truth was able to be kept from her for years on what really went down. For ten years, she had been told that her father's passing was due to a heart attack, but when she was 16, she found out the truth. In Belmont County has its shady side. And as Madison got older, she discovered her father had actually for some time been a drug dealer who flipped, meaning he turned into an informant for the police. There's also long been speculation that the cops up in Belmont aren't necessarily just there to protect and serve. In Akron, which is part of Belmont County, back in 1980, eight officers were indicted on felony charges that included racketeering, bribery, and extortion. Just a couple of years ago, one officer was charged with assault for using his power to make women do things they didn't really want to do. On top of that, J.C. had actually sent his own nephew to jail for the rest of his life as a result of his flipping sides, and so to say there's a possibility that maybe there's more to his murder is an understatement. Madison would go on to make a podcast about her father's case called Ice Cold Files. It's a good listen if you haven't checked it out. This initial dive into her father's unsolved murder not only captivated listeners, but also brought forth a lot of tips and people who lived in the area, each one carrying pieces of a puzzle that had been scattered by time and secrecy. The outpouring of information was actually unprecedented, bridging gaps that Madison had once thought there was no way to get over. So now, she's back with part two of the series, where some of her extended family is pretty unhappy with all the dirt she's digging up. They thought this case was long closed, but now it seems like it's getting a new life. That's exactly what Madison is looking to do. Part two of her series comes out this month, Check it out if you want to learn all the details of this case. Number 2. Trouble on the Water This one is a real whodunit slash what happened, so I'll give you the details and let you decide. Sarm Heslop from England, 41-year-old former flight attendant turned yacht chef, met an American man on Tinder, Ryan Bain, and the two hit it off. It was right in the heart of COVID, and the two carved out a good workaround for themselves in order to keep traveling and stay working while being together. Ryan owned a 47-foot catamaran named the Siren Song, and together, down in the U.S. Virgin Islands, he would rent it out to guests. He was the captain, and Sarm was the chef on board. When they didn't have a charter, they lived off a luxury boat, sailing around to different spots and generally just enjoying life. They were together for around eight months when on the night of March 8th of 2021, Sarm disappeared and has not been seen ever since. That night, they dined at the bar 420 to Center on St. John Island before returning to their floating home. According to Bain, they settled in for a night of Netflix and chill, unaware it would be their last together. Sometime in the early hours, the anchor alarm blasted loudly Bain woke up to take care of it, but also found no sign of Sarm. Her wallet and passport and even her phone were there. It wasn't like she left the boat. At 2.30 that morning, Bain called 911 and told them what had happened. The answer is, nothing really, and that's the problem. The mystery deepened as there was a delay of nine hours before he notified the Coast Guard, who should have been the first people he contacted and he would have known that being a boat captain. He claimed he thought that the police were going to arrive, which they never did, and so at around 11.30 the following morning, he finally called the Coast Guard. And once they showed up with police, he didn't allow them on his boat, which is suspicious. And the authorities, hamstrung by a lack of cooperation and evidence, didn't have much to go on. It wasn't like they could arrest him on the spot right then and there. They had nothing to arrest him for. Ever since, it's been a struggle to get answers. I mean that in the sense that the authorities won't ever respond to the family's emails or calls anymore. Police never examined that boat, and 
They never formally spoke to Bane about the night in question. But Sarm is gone, and surely someone must know something. Andrew Baldwin, Sarm's best friend, has been a vocal advocate in the search for truth. He's pleaded with Bane to cooperate fully with investigators and, at the very least, just tell them his side of the story, especially if he has nothing to hide. Bane, meanwhile, has maintained his innocence the entire time, simply saying that she's gone and that's all he knows. His attorney asserts that Bane is as heartbroken as anyone, emphasizing his immediate efforts to find Sarm and his cooperation with authorities. Yet the refusal to allow a search of the siren song is sketchy, especially since right after the incident, he sailed over to Granada, where he replaced his below-deck refrigerator with a new one. And on top of that, Bane has a conviction for assaulting his ex-wife. The case has drawn comparisons to other high-profile disappearances, highlighting differences in investigative vigor and public attention. There's just something about smaller countries and islands not wanting to be told how to act or what to do by people from other places, and so they just don't answer. Eslop's family and friends, bolstered by the expertise of former homicide commander David Johnston, refuse to let the case go quietly, though. Their determination demands answers, and they seek justice for Sarm, whatever her fate may be. So, tragic accident? Maybe she fell overboard, or did she decide to start life anew, just leaving that boat and walking off into St. John's where maybe she still is? Or did Bane have something to do with it? Maybe Netflix and chill was anger and violence. It's tough to say for sure. Hopefully, the authorities will step up and do what's right. Number 1. The Blood Drop Among the rolling green hills in Danby, Vermont, a quiet town experienced a very dark day more than three decades ago. It was a mystery surrounding the death of two people that lingered unsolved until a single drop of blood gave new life to a case that otherwise would have been stuck among the cold case files forever. On September 17th of 1989, Danby was rocked by the gruesome discovery of the bodies of 76-year-old George and 73-year-old Catherine Peacock. They were found inside their own home after a welfare check was done because George had failed to show up to his morning shift over at the Rutland Lodge. A neighbor went over to his house, where you could see George was at the very least injured through a window. The house was locked, so he gained entry using the garage door opener in one of their cars. Inside, George was laying at the foot of the stairs, Catherine in an unfinished bedroom that was being renovated upstairs. The couple, beloved and integral members of their community, met their end through multiple stab wounds and a crime that seemed senseless. But with no signs of forced entry and nothing valuable being taken from the home, you may know that points to this killing being committed by someone who likely knew the couple. And within weeks of the murder, circumstantial evidence began to weave a web around Michael Anthony Louise, suggesting his involvement in the dark deed. He was their son-in-law, married to one of their daughters. However, the lack of concrete evidence and the limitations of forensic technology at the time meant that Louise remained a free man. And so for years, the case just grew colder, and in all honesty, those who knew George and Catherine just assumed their case had been abandoned altogether. More than three decades had passed, so who can blame them, but then a breakthrough came unexpectedly, all thanks to modern DNA testing. In May of 2020, detectives revisited the evidence. A single drop of blood found inside Louise's car in October of 1989, which had previously yielded inconclusive results because back then, DNA testing was barely even a thing. But this time, the results were definitive, matching the DNA to George Peacock, which irrefutably linked Louise to the crime scene. And the arrest of 79-year-old Michael on two counts of second degree happened in Syracuse, New York, where he was living, having been long divorced from his wife. And this marked the end of a 33-year-old long chapter of uncertainty and grief for the family and friends of the Peacocks. As for the motivation, well, 
That's never been revealed. Michael and his wife did receive some money from them in the will, but it wasn't much. Although considering this was the only blemish on Michael's criminal record, perhaps it was enough to convince him that he'd be better off if his in-laws weren't around anymore. So there were the strange and scary mysteries of the month for March 2024. If you enjoyed this, remember to subscribe, hit the bell so you can know when we're putting out new content. It's three episodes every single week. Thanks so much for stopping by, keeping me company. Y'all watch your backs out there. I'll see you guys soon.